Greetings and welcome to St. John's Church. We are delighted to have you all joining us today for online worship. Uh, today is the second Sunday after Pentecost. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. A collect for the second Sunday after Pentecost. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your providence that your church may joyfully serve you in quiet confidence and godly peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson today is from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Paul writes, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this second Sunday after Pentecost is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let me pray for us. God, I I pray today that you would instill in us a resilient faith despite our weakness, despite the adversity that we face in this world. What a resilient faith that comes through our relationship with you. It's known through an unveiled acceptance of your glory as seen on the cross of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. So I came across this, uh, this article in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, I would say, just to build myself up, that I'm regularly reading the Harvard Business Review, but that's not the case. Um, this article was published in 2002. It was then republished, and this is how I found it, in a book in 2015 as, as part of the review's 10 Must Read series, where they gather the 10 Must Read articles about different topics and, and, and bind them all together. And, and so this, this article tells a story of this, uh, of this seasoned writer that the author knew from her early days as a fledgling reporter. This is a, a man that she gives the pseudonym of Klaus Schmidt, and she describes Klaus this way. She says that he is the quintessential newsman, that he's cynical at times, but unrelentingly curious and full of life, often hilariously funny in a sandpaper dry kind of way. And she goes on to say that that this man was skilled at his craft and admired by his colleagues, that he could turn out quality feature stories and cover articles while also mentoring the cub reporters, talking about the novels he was writing, and always looking forward to what the future held for him. Clearly, this man made an impression on her, but, but it's not for those reasons. What made an impression on her was that Klaus found a way to thrive despite years of personal and professional hostility and pain and suffering and loss. You see, she would come to find out that Klaus had survived three major leadership changes at this magazine, that he had lost valuable friends and valuable colleagues, trusted colleagues along the way and in that process of transition, and yet he remained. He also, over the course of his life, lost two of his children to what she describes as an incurable illness. And then, tragically, he lost a third child in a traffic accident. 
And yet here he was. He was accomplished. He was well-loved. He's upbeat, hopeful for the future. And so she asked the question, what quality did Klaus Schmidt possess that carried him through these hardships without faltering? Well, the author and throughout the article goes on to identify this quality as the quality of resilience. And then she goes on to define three sort of characteristics that, that in her studies she finds of this quality of resilience that allow some people to overcome the dark days and the difficulties that cause others to just crumble underneath them. And this is what she came up with. She said the three characteristics of resilience and people who express resilience or that they accept reality no matter how harsh, that they find meaning even in difficult circumstances, and then finally that they embrace improvisation, they embrace ingenuity. As I was reading 2 Corinthians, I was reminded of this article because these are the exact qualities that Paul uses to describe the resilient faith of those who recognize the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So if you want to open up and follow along, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're beginning at the 13th verse. Now, I have to define the term sort of at the beginning because Paul uses the terms we and you, and so we need to know who he's talking about. Who is the we? Who is the you? Paul describes throughout this letter the we. He says, the we is those who believe that Christ, through his death and resurrection, has removed the veil, the thing that comes between us and God, that that hides us from seeing the full glory of God, so that we may receive God fully, and in receiving him, be transformed by our personal and intimate relationship with him. And so we are those who are in Christ. Now you, in this letter, for Paul, is the Corinthians. You is the people to whom he has shared what has been revealed to him about Jesus. And so by extension, the you is anyone who picks up this letter to hear and to receive what Paul has, reve- has, what has been revealed to Paul. Now, this is the first thing that Paul says. He says, we must face reality no matter how harsh. Now, he's already begun making this point. It goes back to the, to the start of chapter 4, but we'll pick it up at the 13th verse. He's given a couple reality checks already, but then in verse 13, he, he gives another. He says in verse 13, he says, for your sake, we carry on believing and speaking. We, those who are in Christ, the ministers of the gospel, because, or excuse me, despite the adversity that we face. Now, Paul alludes to this adversity in the quotation that he makes of King David in Psalm 116. In the 10th verse, verse of Psalm 116, David writes, I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. And so Paul is saying, with this exact same trust that we see in the Psalms, that we see in King David himself, with this same trust in God, despite adversity, despite affliction, despite difficult circumstances, we also go on believing and speaking. You see, the reality that we face is a life of faith that will be met with adversity. That's just the cold, hard truth, as they say. And yet, despite this, we carry on. And Paul gives us two reasons. Verse 14, he says, We know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. You see, the power of God over evil, it's it's most obvious in the resurrection of Jesus, and that's what Paul points us to. That horrible cry that we read in the Gospels, crucify him. See, that was the cry of sin. And yet the result of his crucifixion is the triumph of God. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that Jesus' resurrection is God's triumph over sin, and that if he can do that, he certainly can bring us and those who we reach into his presence with his beloved Son. And so that's the first reason that we carry on despite the adversity that we face. Then in verse 15, Paul says, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. 
You see, Paul says we carry on because we know the power of the grace that we have been asked to carry. We've experienced it ourselves in our own life, those of us who are in Christ. We know that it has the power to change hearts because it's changed ours. We know that we are grateful for the changes that it has brought about in us, just no matter how hard they are. And we know that those who receive this grace from us, they will also be grateful for the transformation that takes place within. And we know that that in this process of more and more grace that leads to more and more gratitude in more and more people, we know that the God whom we love is glorified. And so this is the the faith that we carry forward. It's not blind. It's not blind to the world, but it's resilient. It's painfully sometimes aware of the harsh reality that we face so that we are prepared to face it and to not lose hope. The author's article calls this resilience at work. She says, the fact is, when we truly stare down reality, we prepare ourselves to act in ways that allow us to endure and survive extraordinary hardship. We train ourselves how to survive before the fact. And so we are called, Paul says, to put this resilience to work in our faith. Now here's the second thing that Paul says, that we are to face this reality even when we have to admit our own weakness, as difficult as that may be sometimes. We, we pick up the letter at verse 16. Though our outer self is wasting, our way, wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Here's the reality that we face. Our outer self is weak, and it's trending towards death, and we just can't deny that. There's a great preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he said this in his commentary on Romans. He says, the moment we enter into this world and we begin to live, we also begin to die. Your first breath is one of the last you will ever take. And yet we carry on. We're called to carry on with resilient faith, despite our weakness, because we know that this is how God has planned it. Paul says in verse 7 of this chapter that we have this treasure in, in jars of clay, jars of clay which are breakable, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. You see, it's through human weakness, it's through our weakness that the triumph of God is on display for all to see. The triumph of God is in us and transforms us day by day, as Paul says, from one degree of glory to another, all because of that intimate, unveiled relationship that we have with God through his Son, Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, do not lose heart. Remain resilient face reality, find meaning. We face reality in verse 18 when we acknowledge the transient things that are seen, our weakness, the adversity that we face. And we find meaning when we acknowledge their purpose, the eternal things that are unseen, as as Paul says in verses 16 and 17, the renewal of our spirit and our preparation for a future glory. Now, we don't have time to get into this third characteristic that the article uh, identifies, this third characteristic of resiliency, uh, embracing improvisation, embracing ingenuity, but Paul does actually get there in this letter, and so that's just a cliffhanger for you. I'm not going to read it, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but, but look at chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. There's this beautiful, poetic exposition of all that Paul is willing to do and all that he's willing to endure to present the gospel without any barrier to the Corinthians. It's beautiful, and it falls right in line with that third point of the article, that we are to apply those values, that meaning that we have found in Jesus Christ and in the adversity that we face in our own weakness in a way that it shows creativity and embraces improvisation. Now, I want to conclude to speaking to to both the the we and the you, to those who are in Christ and to those who are not yet in Christ. First, for the you, for the non-believers, if if your pursuit of understanding the great questions of life, in your pursuit, I encourage you to seek out the people that Paul describes here, those who have lived what they believe, 
at great cost to themselves, those who have shown that they are willing to take care of you, no matter the cost. When you find those people, imagine as you talk to them, this is what you'll find. The thing that you think prevents God from loving you, or maybe the the difficulty in your life that you think proves that God doesn't, in fact, love you, oftentimes that is the very thing that God wants to overcome to prove that he does, in fact, love you no matter what. Now, to do that, we have to face an unsettling reality that God is more aware of our weaknesses than we are, that he understands our suffering even better than we do. But if that's true, then it makes sense why he would send his son. And in fact, that is exactly why he sent his son, so that, so that your weakness and my weakness might not be to our shame, that our suffering might not be in vain, but that instead that it might be used to his glory to transform us into stronger, more resilient people, more resilient than we can imagine, stronger than we can imagine, full of life and glory beyond which we can comprehend. And finally, for, for the we, for the believers, for those who are in Christ, our, we have to admit ourselves that, that our weakness doesn't inhibit God's grace. It's not a reason for us to check out of the game. Rejection and hardships, they, they don't make us failures. The truth is, if you feel unprepared to act publicly on your faith, if you feel unequipped to share personally who Christ is to you, then most likely you are ready to do that exact thing. If your honest attempt to share the truth of Christ as you have received it has had mixed results, it means you're probably doing it right. See, we're asked to carry on anyway with a resilient faith that understands that the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been placed in our unequipped hands and in our overwhelmed hearts to show others the power of God that's at work within us. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the The Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. He shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers, inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness 
and so guide and direct their leaders, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Myers Irvin, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. And we commend to thy gracious care and keeping all those who serve the common good, especially our military, those in law enforcement, first responders, health care workers, and all those who go into harm's way to protect us, to defend us, and to rescue us from danger. We pray especially for Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Kopp, Matt Harvey, Bridge Jernigan, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCarrier, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Tom Miller, Mike Shaw, John Taft, Ben Thornton, Stephen Turner, Ricky Tyner, and Peter Warren. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to our servants, Archbishop Foley Beach and Bishop Mark Lawrence, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverence, and obedient hearts, we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Bailey Cannon, Joanne Fisher, Sarah Gallette, Leela Gary, Emily Harding, Libby Hazelton, Castle Kennedy, Peggy Kinney, Billy McCrary, Shot Paget, Bill Sawyer, Asa Skinner, and Sheila Tetley. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear especially Libby Loder, aunt of Susan Canney, that your will for them may be fulfilled. We ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of St. John and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed, against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please Thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of Thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all who travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you and and also with you. God's peace. God's peace. Again, God's peace and welcome. We are delighted to have you joining us today for online worship. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, One week from uh, tomorrow, uh, we will begin Vacation Bible School. We are very excited to have that ministry back after a year off during the pandemic. invite you to please uh, keep our youth pastor, Charlotte, and uh, all of her volunteers in your prayers. Uh, We're expecting around 100 kids for Vacation Bible School uh, it will be a lot of fun, and we're, we're excited to have uh, all those folks back on our uh, campus. Also, I want to remind everyone that on July the 2nd, uh, we will have St. John's Night at the ball game. We are going to uh, watch the Red Wolves game. Uh, the game will be at 7 p.m. Uh, gates will open at 6 p.m. Uh, food will be provided, and they will also have uh, 4th of July fireworks that night. So again... Uh, July the 2nd, Red Wolves game. Uh, If you would just call the office and and let us know if you can join us for that. It's fun for the entire family. Uh, A great evening uh, at the ball field. Uh, Last but not least, we have several folks that are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, Happy birthday to Helen Campbell and to Clay Smith. Happy birthday to Caitlin Commander and to Ryan Matney, to Eleanor Carson Happy birthday to Bob Rickman and Thomas Warren, and happy birthday to Eric Warren. We also want to wish a happy anniversary to Lori and Walker Wilcox, to Julia and Mark Bike, and a happy anniversary to Kitty and Jean Cutler. Again, delighted to have you joining us online for worship. Just want to remind everyone that we are in person on Sundays at 9 a.m. in the back uh, under the pavilion. We invite you to dress for the weather. For that service, uh, whether it's warm or rainy or cold or whatever, dress for the weather. That's an outdoor service at 9 on Sundays. And we're here in our historic sanctuary uh, at 11 on Sundays. We also have our midweek service of Holy Eucharist and healing at 1030 uh, on Wednesdays in the chapel. So please, if you haven't yet, uh, consider coming to join us for live uh, in-person worship. All of those services at this point are mask optional. Again, thank you for being with us, and at this time I'd like to invite you to join us for our closing prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. And now we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Most merciful Father, send down upon the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina your heavenly blessing. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that in the election of a bishop coadjutor, we might conduct our work in love and faith and in purity of heart. We pray that you would send to us a shepherd of your own choosing, a faithful servant of your gospel to hold up the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, and seek the lost. We ask all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now together we pray the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father Father of all mercies, 
We, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.